change lives, change your lives, change organizations, change organizations, change organizations, change organizations, change the world. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here. Of course, being a good businessman, I uh, try to size up the competition and check on who's been here. Thank you. Uh, three meetings ago, you had the CEO of Citigroup, one of those institutions that are too big to fail but keep failing. <laughs> and you had a partner from McKinsey. And last week, as you mentioned, uh, Dean, you had the president of Turkey. So a banker, a consultant, and a politician, and you're rounding up that list of most popular institution with big oil. So <laughs> but uh, seriously, it's uh, indeed nice to be here. I, I of course, love the Bay Area. I, uh, had the fortune that Aramco sent me here on a, develop, on a working assignment in San Francisco uh, back early in my career in the very early 80s. And like all of you, you're, I'm sure this is an area that one can't resist. Uh, and then, of course, our company uh, extends back in history. Our roots are actually in the Bay Area. Uh, Aramco, uh, Saudi Aramco, is the Saudi Arabian oil company today. Uh, but we started with a concession to Standard Oil of California, and the first name of the company that ran that con concession was called California Arabian Standard Oil Company. So California was ahead of Arabian in, in the roots uh, of Saudi Aramco. And of course, to top it off, just a couple of weeks ago, my youngest son has announced that he's joining Stanford in September. So this is just to round. <laughs> so you may be seeing more of me in the future. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's truly uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is uh, the finest school. Uh, in my opinion, uh, on many fronts, and certainly the business school uh, ranks as, as one of the best. And in fact, I have some of my colleagues who are products of uh, your executive education uh, program and also the School of Earth Sciences. Those uh, historic links uh, with, with the institution are reflected in many ways. Today, uh, I mentioned uh, colleagues, we have 40 Stanford graduates, the highest of which is actually the chairman of Saudi Aramco and our uh, Minister of Petroleum, who is also a graduate of the School of Earth Sciences and Geology. And we have 13 students who uh, are enrolled here. I, I hope some of them are here. Okay, good. I, I saw 13 hands. <laughs> if not, you are going to hear from me. <laughs> but we also had 30 MBAs, I understand, earlier this year. I tried to meet them when they were here. Are there any of the MBAs who came to Saudi Arabia in, in the crowd today and visited the company? I see a few hands. I hope you enjoyed your trip and it was uh, instructive and useful for you. And certainly we hope that more of these exchanges between our employees and the students of Stanford will be continuing in the future. Later on tonight, I will be having the pleasure of joining with your provost, Etchemendi, Dr. Etchemendi, and some of the leadership of the School of Earth Sciences to celebrate an endowment that Saudi Aramco is putting in place to endow a chair in the name of Max Steinecke that the Dean has talked about, our first chief geologist and a pioneer in every uh, meaning of the word. If I can elaborate on what he said, this man who came from very humble beginnings, had his education here at Stanford, went and tried finding oil in Indonesia and Alaska and elsewhere and just thought that the frontier place to go to was the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So he called Chevron and said, you just signed a concession with the kingdom, and I want to be part of it. And he was sent to a country with no roads, 
no airports, no air conditioning, no electricity for that matter. Literally, uh, a country that was hundreds of years uh, behind at that time in terms of infrastructure and amenities to support life. And he mapped the whole kingdom. There were no maps. And uh, started drilling after five years of frustration. The headquarters office in San Francisco up the road sent a cable to, uh, to the people in the field and ordered them to stop working. Well, Max didn't want to hear of this, so he hid the instruction from his team. And they were drilling at that time the seventh well and ordered them to drill a little deeper after receiving that instruction. Well, the rest is history because drilling a little deeper, they discovered our first gusher, our first commercial oil discovery, and the mum number seven, which became lucky number seven, and later on was named by the king of the kingdom as the prosperity well. well. Since then, more oil has been produced by our company than any other company in the world. So it's in the, inspired by this instruction and the spirit of Steinecke, of drilling a little deeper, that I would like to talk to you today. I'd like to drill a little deep, bit deeper about Saudi Aramco, and I think the dean did a good job of giving you some of the top line numbers and, and our position in the market. But for you to really make sense of my views uh, from the top, as the lecture series is called, you really need to understand what is happening at the bottom, so to speak, and a, a cross-section of functions and levels uh, of the company. So I will try to drill a little bit deeper about what Aramco is, what it is context, and how it runs its business nationally, globally, and in the very important energy uh, markets. Now, one thing I want to be careful because I know this lecture is taped and I don't want later on to be used as evidence. I'm not encouraging any of you to uh, refuse the instructions of your bosses when they ask you to do something. So although we're, we're, we're very happy with the fact that Steinecke continued drilling and discovered oil, the intent uh, always we encourage our people to do, listen to instructions uh, from their management. Let me uh, start by giving you that uh, in-depth uh, presentation about what the company uh, does and, and where we are. As I mentioned, we produce more oil than any other company. The dean mentioned that we're producing 10%. Actually, the numbers has gone up. You can count today that we produce one out of every seven barrels of oil produced around the world. That is. 10 million out of about 72 barrels, 72 million barrels of oil that are produced globally. Saudi Aramco is also a significant gas, or, uh, gas producer. Uh, we are one of the top uh, gas producers in the world. We, have, we are the only one that has any spare production capacity to speak of. As a company, we have more than half of the global spare oil production capacity. So our decisions on production, our ability to respond, uh, or God forbid, uh, not, not being able to respond, could have consequences not only to the oil market, but to the global economy uh, that are uh, not equaled or not matched by any other company uh, in the world. This, of course, requires not just reserves and resources, which we have plenty of, but it requires unique capabilities, operational capabilities, technical capabilities, financial capabilities, management and leadership capabilities, and the ability to lead in a, in a business that is the most politicized of any uh, business. The oil market is highly uh, politicized, as you all know. And downstream, in addition to that dominant position in the upstream, we are uh, also quite sizable. We have joint ventures around the world, and we have a sizable refining capacity uh, in the kingdom, and our operations range from here in the US all the way extending in China and, uh, and Japan 
and Korea on, uh, in Asia. In terms of our financial position, we're probably one of the very few, probably the only company I know of of our size and scale that have no debt on our balance sheet. We are so strong financially that we have been uh, you know, financially uh, long in, in our cash flow for as long as I can remember. We pay taxes and royalty, and we have an arm's length relationship with, with the shareholder, uh, which is uh, the tax collector at the same time. We fund our own uh, capital and operating expenditures, and then we pay dividends afterwards, but we've never been in a situation where we as Saudi Aramco have to borrow money to fund uh, our operations. So we're fiscally responsible and capable as a company. Of course, with this competence, financial position, and influence on global markets, uh, energy and otherwise, there comes a lot of responsibility. There comes a lot of global responsibility because we always look at the influence that oil has on global economy and we have to manage that relationship very carefully. But also being the national oil company of a developing country like Saudi Arabia that is still relatively early in its development cycle, we have a unique responsibility within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia to leverage everything we have and enable the acceleration of the development of the kingdom. We are, of course, the predominant source of revenue for the kingdom. We are the only supplier of energy to businesses, utilities, and individuals within the kingdom. But beyond that, we are expected to do a lot more. In addition to what you would expect an oil and gas company to have, the drilling, the subsurface reservoir uh, management, the vast uh, operating plant for upstream, midstream, uh, and downstream, given the concentration and complexity of our uh, oil and gas core business uh, and the scale of what we do, we also run a lot of support businesses that are unique for any company of any kind. We have uh, a significant fleet of aircraft, both fixed wing and helicopter, to manage our operations. We have uh, hundreds of marine vessels that manage uh, both our offshore production as well as our transportation of crude uh, around uh, the world. We have housing compounds that houses tens of thousands of our employees and their families. We have remote area camps that support our plants uh, in the desert. We have a healthcare system that has hundreds of thousands of patients that we fully support on all of their uh, medical care. So the company, in addition of being at scale, to say the least, in oil and gas, we have all of these unique and diverse support services that make Saudi Aramco indeed uh, one, of a kind, one of a kind. Now, because of the breadth and complexity of these various mandates that I talked about, the international, the national, uh, the business, it is always a challenge to remind ourselves to stay close to our mission. And let me just say, for, for your sake, what the mission is. Saudi Aramco's mission as an integrated international company is to engage in all activities related to the hydrocarbon industry on a commercial basis and for the purpose of profit. This is a very focused and a very smartly written uh, mission statement to remind us that despite everything I said about the international, the geopolitical, the macroeconomic impact of the company, that ultimately at our core, just like any other multinational company, any other private company, we have to operate with profitability and commerciality first and foremost uh, on our mind. That means a number of things. We have to execute at best-in-class levels. We never let the fact that we are a national oil company get in the way of being best-in-class in all of the key core operations of the company, whether it's our rate of discovery of hydrocarbons, how we recover them, our cost of production. And if we measure ourselves typically, typically we are the lowest cost or the highest performance in every metric 
that uh, we use in measuring ourselves against our peers uh, and, and the competition. We also have to constantly focus on building capacity and renewing ourselves. Uh, our business is a long-term business, and being in Saudi Arabia, accessing talent is not easy. So we always have to build capacity from within, especially training and developing our own people. And I talked about the various people we have sent to Stanford over the many decades, and we'll continue to do that. So building capacity for the company is something that we have done and we will continue, uh, continue to do. Managing execution means that we have to work on day-to-day -day operations extremely closely. We never get away, and, and you have seen in the headlines what oil companies get into, if they ever miss a step, so to speak. So focusing on day-to-day -day operations, ours is probably by far the most risky and dangerous business of any business uh, out there, and we focus on safety, environmental stewardship, and operational reliability. I talked earlier about the impact of Saudi Aramco slipping on its commitments, and uh, we never take a chance on allowing that uh, to happen. We also have to invest very, very wisely. Every dollar we invest, we ensure we'll have the highest possible uh, rate of return. The upstream is always first, but we are uh, long on capital, so we look also at our downstream, which for those of you not familiar with the industry, that means the refining, the chemical, the marketing, and trading uh, businesses. Just yesterday, I was in Texas for inaugurating a $10 billion refinery at Port Arthur. This is an expansion of a refinery that was built initially in 1903, and we bought into in a joint venture with Texaco, which ultimately became with Shell. And this $10 billion will take probably a few decades for it to pay off, but that's the kind of business we're in, investing for the long term, and our assets and facilities are designed for that purpose. Uh, earlier in March, I was in China, and we signed a number of agreement, joint venturing with a number of Chinese firms to invest both in China and various downstream facilities there as well as cementing an agreement already in place to build a refinery on the west coast of uh, Saudi Arabia. So we're involved in the Western Hemisphere, uh, as well as in emerging markets uh, in Asia, and China is not the only one. Last month in Tokyo, we had our board meeting. And one of the presentations in that board meeting was by our upstream uh, engineers and scientists who were presenting our long-term production profile showing where we would be producing literally in the next century. So we're looking 100 years in advance at how we will continue to steward and produce the resources we've already identified and booked as well as to unlock additional resources through a commitment to science uh, and exploration and investing in long-term program. Now, these are programs that would keep any company extremely uh, busy and, 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 uh, uh, and challenged, but I already alluded to a unique position that Saudi Aramco in, which is, which is being the engine of a whole nation of about 30 million that is relatively early in its development cycle. So in addition to all of the financial uh, contributions we make, the whole nation expects Saudi Aramco to do a lot more in uh, leveraging our capabilities, enhancing human resource development within the kingdom, partnering with educational institutions. Today, one of the colleagues I have with me is the executive vice president of KAUST, which is the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. This is a university that we built from scratch, and we aim for it to be an equivalent of Stanford, uh, not too long into the future. 
focusing on uh, the specific disciplines that it's focused on, which is uh, science and technology. Also, we are leveraging the various downstream investments I talked about to create value addition in manufacturing and attracting investment either of our own, our partners, or third parties to create value addition and jobs for a young uh, population, which is a demographic challenge that the kingdom and many countries in the Middle East have. A fourth challenge uh, that I would mention is the fact that oil uh, is uh, a political commodity. It is quite intertwined with not only economy, but also environmental issues, uh, geopolitical issues. Uh, and uh, that uh, complexity creates a lot of pressure on the industry. There is a lot of debate. Uh, they say that all of the debate you hear about energy and oil creates a lot of heat, but unfortunately not much light. And we try to do our bit to engage in that debate. So you will find oil executives uh, in my company and myself engaged in discussions ranging from uh, the World Economic Forum to uh, G20 discussions to uh, developing countries discussions like in China when I was there in March to try to enlighten uh, the public opinion about uh, energy and the central role that uh, fossil fuels will continue to play for decades to come until we're able to transition in a more uh, rational way to uh, renewables and other sources of energy. So to recap on the little uh, deep drilling that I was trying to do today on, on the company, we are the world's largest uh, and I would argue the most successful uh, and profitable energy enterprise, but we do face tremendous challenges as an industry and in terms of development of our nation, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, as well as a host of other uh, challenges we have. But I think the important thing that we realize is we have great opportunities ahead of us. The challenges are manageable and we are dealing with them and what we are looking for at the, are the opportunities we have. When I took uh, office in 2009 and I looked at the company and I just recited to myself some of the things I just mentioned to you, you could make an argument that the best thing we could do was continue to operate at best in class, improve incrementally on the areas where improvements are required, and basically protect the great company we have. However, we viewed tremendous opportunities available to Saudi Aramco, opportunities available at the international level, opportunities available at the national level, and a huge deal of untapped potential within the company, leveraging the fiscal position we have, the financial position, leveraging the talent that many of our people want, and the desire to do more and contribute more uh, to, uh, to the company and to themselves and to their nation and to the world. So we launched, after much deliberation and consensus building within the company, we launched a program that we termed the Accelerated Transformation Program. Take this jacket. At that time, to build that consensus, one of uh, the metaphors we used as we went around and, and talked amongst ourselves as the leadership team and then with the rest of the company, Saudi Aramco was in an equal position to a racing car to a Formula One uh, vehicle. But it's a Formula One vehicle that is being driven within the city and going through stoplights and intersections and therefore driving at a much slower speed than its full potential. And the only way that Saudi Aramco would be able to attain its full potential would be to take it out from the inner city, put it on the superhighway, rev up the engine and get it to drive at its full potential. And basically the limitation we figured at that time was us. 
Are we really allowing the company to get there or not? So we launched this accelerated transformation program. And I will just mention briefly what we ultimately came up with, which is the strategic intent of the company. And it's quite ambitious. It says in 2020, Saudi Aramco will be the world's leading integrated energy and chemicals company, focusing on maximizing its income, facilitating the sustainable and diversified expansion of the kingdom's economy, and enabling a globally competitive and vibrant Saudi energy sector. So in addition to growing the company substantially in its portfolio, we linked into our basically vision statement for 2020, an element of enabling a whole national economy to transform, to diversify, and to uh, get into a knowledge base less dependent on us as the sole source of uh, revenue. Those 39 words became basically the mandate I give to, to my management in every interactions I have with them. Now that's a very ambitious program we have, but translating it down to execution was a whole different matter. So we cascaded it down into 14 different initiatives. And those 14 initiatives were categorized in four different pillars that are driving the strategic transformation, which is now one year in the making. The first pillar is what you would call Strategy 101. It's basically reshaping the portfolio of Saudi Aramco, rebalancing the company from being predominantly upstream oil and gas, basically producing raw materials to one where we will have a strong position, a stronger than we already have in the downstream. We'll be the world's largest refiner. We'll be one of the largest chemical company. We'll have a huge position in power generation, including, you might be surprised to hear, renewables. Uh, as we go forward. The second pillar was about a focus program to leverage everything we do to help the national economy of Saudi Arabia, not just in our immediate businesses, but extending beyond. So we have partnerships with education, we have research partnerships uh, in the kingdom, we have manufacturing hubs that we're creating to support us, but at the same time to create jobs. These two pillars are challenging and huge for any other organization. But in my opinion, and I think in the view of anybody who has tried to do change within an organization, that the other two pillars are the most difficult ones. Those you can size up, you can execute on, you can measure, money can buy them to a large degree. The second and the, th the third and the fourth are the ones that require true leadership. One of them is capacity building. So reinvigorating the leadership of the company. We have a great leadership today, and we have taken the company to where it is, and, and, and there are no regrets. But for the company of the future, we need a new style of leadership, and we need new leadership capabilities. And we're working on our human resources from the bottom up to create the next leaders of the company. We have, in, in four years' time, 40% of the company workforce will be below the age of 30, so dealing with the, with the Y generation, so to speak, is, is an opportunity as much as a challenge that we have to seize and uh, deliver on. The other part of capability building in addition to leadership and human resources is technology and building enough research and development with the company to keep us uh, almost self-sufficient. We have a good deal of that going on now, but we will multiply it by an order of magnitude in uh, the year to come. The fourth uh, pillar is changing uh, how we do business. I think I've described to a large degree what we do and changing what we do, but then ch changing how we do things will be even more challenging. And that is reinventing uh, all of our business, uh, business procedures and systems within the company. And that is very tough because these systems and procedures have been good for us. They've gotten us to where we are, to the leadership position we enjoy today, and to convince people that we will go through the change process, which is not easy, and throw away the systems and processes that have gotten us to where we are, is, uh, is there is a lot of selling, and then there is a lot of pain in execution. So we've already uh, overhauled our planning process, strategy development, 
uh, as well as capital project execution in order to get to that next 5-10% of excellence that we think we need to get to be the world's not only leading and largest and most profitable, but also most admired company in our space of energy uh, and oil and gas. Now, uh, resistance to change will always be there to any firm, even firms that are in trouble. But it's particularly difficult for a firm that is successful, where the stakeholders from the outside are constantly praising you on being the reliable supply of energy to all corners of the world, where the kingdom looks and your nation looks at you as an example of success, where your neighbors are always thankful for your attention to environment, safety, and their well-being. So when you come to all of the stakeholders and say, that's good, en that's good, but it's not good enough. We need to go to the next level of excellence. It takes some selling. But when the opportunities are presented that are to be attained by going through this change, well, I was surprised by how much consensus we were able to build around it and how much energy and enthusiasm. And I thought I would be pulling a lot, and now I am being pushed from the back by the momentum that has been created uh, around the ATP. So I think I'm taking probably as much time as I should take in that uh, deep drill that I wanted to give you on the company and our strategy and a little bit of our history. Uh, I will just end with a metaphor, uh, if I may, on how we looked at uh, our strategy. And, uh, and this metaphor I will call on an athlete called the Great One. And you will be, this is, a, for those of you who don't know, uh, this is Wayne Gretzky. He's a hockey player. And you probably never thought that a Saudi oil man will be, <laughs> We'll be giving you a metaphor about a hockey player. But uh, Wayne Gretzky uh, is reported to have said, I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate where, to where the puck is going to be. And that's exactly how we think at Saudi Aramco. Uh, we're not running after what we're doing today. We're running after where we want to be in 10, 20, 30, or even 50 years from now. And we're trying to position the company to go from the greatness it has achieved over uh, almost 80 years of history to leading our uh, business and sector for 80 years uh, to come. And of course, I would just caution that thinking big and thinking strategic, you should never lose sight of managing execution, managing day to day, and staying fit. I'm sure Wayne Gretzky had the smarts and had the sixth sense of knowing where to be but he also worked very hard of being as fit as the other guy and working well with the team, which is exactly what I try to do, uh, building uh, a strong team within my company and a strong teaming relationship with the partners we have uh, around the world. So that's all I wanted to say in my opening remarks, and I look forward to uh, the Q&A. side or that? Either one. Thanks again uh, for joining us here from from the top. It's, it's very fitting to have you as our uh, last speaker for the series, uh, given the value of Saudi Aramco um, is greater than the combined value of all of our prior 12 CEOs that we've had. Um, <laughs> you talked a lot about education um, and the investment Saudi Aramco is making. I had a question from a personal side. Um, what role has education, both uh, your time here in the U.S. and your graduate school, played for you as a leader um, and in shaping your thoughts about leadership? Well, I, I, for me, it works uh, in two ways. Uh, I would say education has uh, taken me from uh, my humble beginnings, where I, I, quite frankly, didn't have a view of the world to where uh, I am today. And, and for that, I'm very thankful. But the flip side of that, I think, in education is it taught me how much I don't know. There are things I know, and there are things that I continuously learn, which is something I learned in school. Of course, I'm sure all of you have learned great things, but rest assured, in 10 years, 
much, much of it will be obsolete. So the, the, the beauty about a good education is it uh, gets you curiosity and a willingness and an ability to constantly renew your knowledge and learn new things. But for me also importantly is uh, it taught me how much I don't know, how much out there that could be learned, if not by me directly, at least by my colleagues, by my uh, institution. So it planted in me uh, a belief that without pursuing the highest degree of education as an individual, as a family, and uh, in my own family, as an institution in Saudi Aramco and as a nation, you not only stand still, but you actually slip behind because the world is constantly advancing and uh, we all need to keep pace. And for those of us who aspire to lead, you just need to lead through education. And that's a belief that I uh, try to, as I mentioned, plant it in the family, in the company, and in our interaction with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia educational institutions. It's great to hear. I know you've done tremendous things around education um, in Saudi Arabia. Um, the, another question that I had was around, um, as a leader, you inevitably must face setbacks um, uh, that come across um, in decisions that you've made. What have you done uh, to kind of face them? And if you can give us an example of a setback and a lesson you've drawn from that. I'm not sure I should give the examples. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk genetically. <laughs> You know, I, I think uh, in life in general, whether it's in business or, or in our private lives, uh, the road forward always has zigzags. So uh, if you believe in yourself uh, and if you believe in your values and if the objectives that you're working for, you take those setbacks in stride and you know they will be a better day. Uh, and of course, one thing that I talk to uh, my colleagues in the company, especially in the reinvigorated Saudi Aramco of the future that we're trying to take, is we have to take risks. And risks means that many of the decisions we make, we will try to mitigate the risks, we will calculate, and we will develop what-if scenarios, and if it doesn't work, what do we do? But once we make the decision, we accept that it may fail, and we move on, we learn the lessons, uh, and move forward. So that has been a motto for me uh, all of my life. Uh, rarely have I met all expectations that I set for myself in series. There is always, uh, every so many steps forward, there is a step back, and, mm -hmm. and you just work with it. Great. Well, I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience at this point, if there are any. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, you talked about uh, the importance of planning long term, including 100 years ahead. Uh, given the changes in the industry, including uh, the flacking and shale gas extraction, discovery of oil in Utah, as well as nuclear explosion, how do you see uh, the changes in the industry and how are you going to uh, respond to the change strategically? Well, uh, we have been uh, arguing for uh, a long time, way before the unconventional uh, game-changing developments here in the U.S. became common knowledge, that the hydrocarbon resource base on Earth are huge. They are not what is booked today as uh, conventional uh, oil reserves. There is a lot more that will be added to reserves as the technology develops and the performance of the industry improves in terms of the rate of discovery and recovery of those reserves improves. And the last 10 to 15 years have proven us uh, correct. Uh, we have in the U.S. now added production and, and the U.S. Has, reserve, has reversed its production decline that has been taking place for uh, for a number of decades and the actually now the U.S. is increasing. To us, that's a good thing because it proves a point that peak oil, as it was called a few years ago, is not uh, accurate, at least in the terms of the timing of, uh, of when the decline will take place, that we have many, many years left in the resource endowment of the earth to manage the transition 
uh, of an economy and a global society that is dependent on hydrocarbons today to other renewable uh, sources and other alternatives that will be developed more economically and uh, in a more rational fashion uh, if we allow it the time to do that. So we don't have to respond. Our production will continue to be there. Saudi Aramco will continue to be the lowest cost producer for as long as there is oil production in the world. And the last oil produced, I assure you, will be produced by Saudi Aramco in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So we have nothing to worry about from the unconventionals. We welcome them. And I think we also, as I mentioned earlier, welcome the role of renewables. And we will be working ourselves with renewables to provide a diverse uh, energy mix to, uh, you know, to a world uh, population that needs it. Um, Saudi Arabia takes some criticism for internal energy consumption levels. And do you, as a leader of the domestic producer, you know, think about that or have influence on that? We think about that, and we have influence about that, and we talked about that. We, in fact, the first alarm bells, uh, I rang them a few years ago uh, uh, in a talk uh, in Riyadh, uh, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and since then, the dialogue has continued and there is increased awareness I would just caution that some of the numbers that are published are exaggerated and they're all, in, all assuming, uh, you know, the, the as-is conditions continuing, that there will be no introduction of efficiency measures, that the kingdom will continue to be wasteful uh, in, in energy use in the future, and that's not correct. The government has taken on a number of serious measures, including uh, creating an agency that is focused on bringing in renewables and nuclear to complement uh, oil and gas in the energy mix. There is a center that has been set and Saudi Aramco is participating in it to bring in efficiency and utilization of energy. And of course, we're uh, busy uh, exploring for and will be producing unconventional ga gas, we hope, shale gas and uh, in, in the future that will uh, displace some of the oil and oil products that are being consumed domestically. So we have a last student question. Hello, my name is Mohamed Saadi from Lebanon, so it's an honor to have someone from our region uh, representing uh, Saudi Aramco. Um, my question is, Saudi Arabia and a lot of other countries in the Gulf have historically relied on talent from outside the borders to build a lot, uh, a lot of their great companies. and. Now there seems to be a push from governments, whether in like the UAE or Saudi Arabia, to push for uh, the local workforce to, to enter and take on more of these roles, like the Emiratization Initiative in the UAE or Sawada and, and Saudi Arabia. And my question is, what are your thoughts on these initiatives? How does it impact you uh, as a business as well? Well, I would, I would go back to the story I mentioned about uh, the American oil companies, you know, uh, that, that own Saudi Aramco. We give them a lot of credit for investing in, uh, in Saudiization, as you called it, Mohammed, and localization. And, you know, some of the graduates I mentioned, our chairman, who graduated 50 years ago, actually, out of Stanford, were sent by the American company. So it is in our heritage. We are not getting directives to do it. We've always being an intern today we have 80 nationalities by the way in our workforce so we're quite a diverse company with uh, both genders working within Saudi Aramco and 80 nationalities representing uh, most countries uh, in the world but the fact is most of our operations today are in Saudi Arabia and it makes sense to hire local whether you're a Saudi or not it's more cost effective more reliable less turnover uh, and, and it just makes good business sense so we've done it all these decades on the basis of being a good business, and we are a good citizen, of course. We, uh, our company is not going to solve uh, the employment challenge in Saudi Arabia. As the dean mentioned, 55,000, 56,000 employees today in, in, in a, a country that needs millions of jobs. But we try to create job opportunities in the business sector that we deal with, our suppliers, our customers, our contractors, we give them training, we, 
work with them hand in hand to create job opportunities for the hundreds of thousands of Saudi job seekers uh, that, that, uh, that are out there looking for jobs. Great, and I'd like to ask uh, one last question before we wrap up. Uh, a question that all of us here at the GSB answer in our process to be admitted here is, what matters most to you and why? Uh, people have answered from a range of family to reading books, um, and would love to ask you that question, how you would answer it as a leader of such an important company. Well, one thing it's difficult, you, re, you know, <laughs> obviously the emotional side comes first and one has to say my family is first uh, and that's, uh, that's the truth. But taking that for granted that all of us have their families as their first instinctive uh, thing or, or issue they care for, then what is the next thing? And for me, the next thing is making an impact uh, that that uh, will be re remembered and will be important for all of the stakeholders that I can impact. The employees of the company, the shareholder and the nation of Saudi Arabia, and the global community that we serve as a company. So running the company the best way we can to meet its objectives and the expectation, the legitimate expectations of our stakeholders, to me, it's something that I think about constantly. Uh, it is more than having a good financial performance at the end of the quarter or at the end of the year. It's more than finishing a set of projects on time, on budget. It is more than the short to intermediate uh, metrics that we all measure ourselves for. It's something, you know, a higher purpose that uh, I believe Saudi Aramco and everybody that works in our company <coughs> serves not only ourselves as employees of the company, not only our nation as uh, the major stakeholder in the company, but in every meaning of the word, the global community, which the company serves by providing reliable supplies of energy and keeping the global markets stable for as long as we can. Great. Please thank me. Thank, join me in thanking uh, Mr. Faleh. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>